In tariff prep, um, what's the difference between a threat, a vulnerability, and a risk? Uh, what is a vulnerability? Um, in short, vulnerability, vulnerability is a weakness. A threat could be like bad guys. A risk would be loss or damage. So, vulnerability is a weakness that could be found in our system, network, or application. System could be like any older version of software. Um, network is the use of unsecured protocols. Application could be like no user input validation. What is a threat? Threat is anything or anyone with potential to harm your company intentionally and unintentionally, internally or externally. As a result of vulnerability, a threat causing a potential loss or damage to your company is a risk. Let's look at the related questions. Um, what's an exploit? Exploit is a tool used to take advantage of the vulnerability. Example, Eternal Blue is an exploit that took advantage of SMB vulnerability. What's a vulnerability assessment? Vulnerability assessment is the process of defining, identifying, classifying, and protectorizing vulnerabilities in computer system applications and network infrastructures. Assessment team closely work with other infrastructure teams to help them remediate or patch vulnerabilities with the system they manage. So what's the difference between vulnerability and assess vulnerability assessment and pen testing? Vulnerability assessment is all about identifying the vulnerabilities and reporting them for patching and remediation. Pen testing is going one step ahead after identifying the vulnerabilities and exploiting the vulnerability, pen testing will help companies assess risk in a better way. What's the difference between TCP and UDP? Both TCP and UDP are the two main transport layer protocols. TCP stands for Transmission Control Protocol is responsible for the majority of the internet traffic. It's connection oriented, meaning that it establishes a connection between two systems before transferring any data, meaning it does the three-way handshake. It could be slower, but TCP is definitely reliable and guarantees delivery. A good example to TCP would be emails and websites. UDP stands for User Datagram Protocol, on the other hand, is much more lightweight protocol. It's not connection-oriented, meaning it doesn't use three-way handshake like TCP does. It sends the data blindly and doesn't really care if you receive it or not, which tells us, by the way, that UDP is fast but not a reliable protocol. A good example to UDP would be voice and videos. Number three, explain three-way handshake. Because TCP is connection-oriented, it uses three-way handshake, technically known as SYN, SYNACT, ACT. Because TCP connection, uh, uh, because TCP is a connection-oriented protocol, systems must go through a handshaking process to create connection before transmitting the data. This process is known as a three-way handshake. In this process, first, client originating the connection sends a packet with SYN flag, indicating that it would like to open a connection. Second, the server that receives the request acknowledges with SYNACT flag. Third, the client receives a SYNACT packet and sends a final act to the server. That's all I can say about this conversation between the client and the server. What is ICMP?
ICMP stands for Internet Control Message Protocol. It's the housekeeping protocol of the Internet. It works on the network layer of OSI model. ICMP sends error messages when you fail to communicate with another source. A good example to ICMP would be ping and trace road commands or tracer commands. Both uses ICMP to operate. A little bit extra information about ICMP. Many network administrators feel that ICMP is a security risk. Therefore, it should be blocked at the firewall. However, disabling all ICMP could cause network issues because it's necessary for troubleshooting. Why do we need ICMP then? It's mainly used to determine whether or not data is reaching its intended destination in a timely manner. It's commonly used on the network devices such as routers. So uh, type 3 and type 4 of ICMP traffic should be allowed at the firewall. Also type 8 out and 0 in to send ping request and not allow ping attacks in. What is ping? Hmm. The ping command is a network tool used to determine whether a certain IP address or host is accessible. In other words, if you have connection to that network, you can use ping command, a command uh, to identify. Example, type either the URL or the IP address to the command line followed by ping and see if you have connection. For example, you write ping google.com to your command line and see if you have connection to Google. What is a trace road or tracert? It's a network di diagnostic command uh, to track and measure data packets from source to destination over an IP network. Let's read it one more time. It's a network diagnostic command used to track and measure data packets from source to destination over an IP network. A trace road in Linux or tracer in Windows can help you to see if there is a breakdown of communication. It shows what routers you touch as you move along to your final destination. If there is somewhere you cannot connect, you can see where it happened. What is SSL and TLS? SSL stands for Secure Socket layer. TLS stands for Transport Layer Security. They are both cryptographic protocols providing secure communication over the network. TLS is an improved version of SSL. They both use encryption to protect the data while transferring. At the start of a TLS or SSL connection, a handshake is done between the client and the server to establish a trust and then negotiate what secret keys should be used to encrypt and decrypt the conversation. So we should enable the new version of TLS 1.2 or 1.3 and disable the rest to secure our connection. What type of encryption method is used for an SSL handshake? SSL and TLS both uses symmetric and asymmetric encryption to protect confidentiality, integrity of the data in transit. Asymmetric encryption is used, sorry, 
Asymmetric encryption is used to establish a secure session between a client and a server. Symmetric encryption is used to exchange the data within the secure session. So here we understand that SSL and TLS both use symmetric and asymmetric encryption to protect their data, uh, confidentiality and integrity. Uh, asymmetric encryption is used when you are establishing a secure session between the client and the server. But the symmetric encryption is used to exchange data within the secure session. We have to use symmetric encryption when we are doing exchanging the data because it's a lot faster. What are the differences between HTTP, HTTPS, SSL and TLS? HTTP, Hypertext Transfer Protocol, is used by the browsers and web servers to communicate and exchange information. When we exchange information, uh, when, we, when the exchange of information is encrypted with SSL or TLS, it's called HTTPS, standing for secure. SSL stands for Secure Socket Layer, a cryptographic protocol providing secure communication. TLS, Transport Layer Security, is the newer version of SSL, or we can say the continuation of SSL. A little bit extra information. Uh, HTTP stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol. It's used for viewing web pages on the internet. In standard HTTP, all the information is sent in clear text. This means that all the information that is exchanged between your computer and the web server is vulnerable to anybody who wants, such as the hackers. Normally, this wouldn't be a problem if you're not sharing any sensitive data, such as passwords and credit card information. This is why HTTPS was developed to secure your sensitive information. HTTPS stands for Secure Hypertext Transfer Protocol. HTTPS encrypts the data that is being transferred over the internet between computers and servers. HTTPS protects the data by using one of the two protocols, SSL or TLS. SSL or Secure Socket Layer is used to ensure security on the internet. It uses public key encryption to secure the data. How does SSL work? Hmm. When a computer connects to a website using SSL, the computer's web browser will ask the website to identify itself. Then the web server will send the computer a copy of its SSL certificate to authenticate the identity of a website. Basically, it's used to let your computer know that the website you are using or visiting is trustworthy. Then the computer browser will check to make sure that it trusts the certificate. If it does, it will send a message to the web server. Then the server will, resp will respond back with an acknowledgement so an SSL session can be proceed and encrypted data can now be exchanged between your computer and the web server. Let's read it one more time. When a computer connects to a website using SSL. The computer's web browser will ask the website to identify itself. Then the web server will send the computer a copy of its SSL certificate to authenticate and identify the website. We're okay here. Basically, it, it is used to let your computer know that the website you are visiting is trustworthy. Then the computer browser will check to make sure that 
the, it trusts the certificate. If it does, it will send a message to the web server and the server will respond back with acknowledgement. So an SSL session can be proceed and encrypted data can now be exchanged between your computer and the web server. TLS or transport layer protocol is the other protocol that secures the HTTP. It's the latest version of SSL, just like SSL, it authenticates the server, client, and encrypts the data. So, uh, both SSL, uh, SSL and TLS authenticates the server, client, and then encrypts the data. A lot of websites are now using HTTPS by default, regardless if the sensitive data is going to be exchanged or not. Google is flagging websites that are not secure if they are not protected with SSL. So if they don't have the certificate, SSL certificate, Google is flagging those websites out. What are the HTTP methods? So. HTTP methods. HTTP methods consist of some verbs and nouns to define a set of requests such as get, put, post, patch, delete, and etc. What do you know about the HTTP status codes? Status code indicates that a specific HTTP request has been successfully complicated. Some of the common response to status codes are 404, not known, 200, successful request, 202, request accepted, 301, moved permanently, 302, found, 351, unavailable for legal reasons, and 403 is forbidden. All right, so anything from 100 to 199 or all the 100s are informational responses. All the 200s are successful responses. All the 300s are redirection messages. All the 400s are client error responses. All the 500s are server error responses. Explain the OS OSI model. Um, OSI stands for Open System Interconnection. It helps us to understand what is going on in the networking system. OSI model consists of seven layers, and each layer has a set of responsibilities. For example, layer one is the physical layer. This layer includes the cable and the wireless connections among the devices. Examples are like Ethernet, fiber optics, Wi-Fi, and etc. Layer two is the data link layer. This layer allows transfer of data in chunks called frames between two nodes on the network and handles error connections from the physical layer. Example, switches. Two sub-layers exist here, Mac Media Access Control layer and LLC, Logical Link layer. Most switches operates at this uh, layer. Layer three is the network layer. This is the routing layer at which our packets are forwarded from their source to their destinations. A good example to network layer uh, is the router, are the routers, IP addresses, ICMP, IPsec. Layer 4, transport layer, pro, uh, represents the protocol uh, for sending and receiving packets across a network via ports. A good example to uh, transport layer would be TCP, UDP, ICMP. Layer five is the session layer. This layer is used when opening, closing, and controlling the sessions between application processes. 
This layer handles setting up sessions between two devices and coordinating the rules for communications, such as how long to wait for a response and how to determine to terminate the session. Layer 6, Presentation Layers, Data Encryption Represents formatting and delivering the data in presentable format for application. At this layer, data is prepared for presentation between the layers. For example, data that is encrypted across the network would be decrypted at this layer for presentation to an application at the destination device. Example, JPEG, SSL, HTML, DOC, MP3, AVI, and etc. Layer 7, Application Layer, User Interaction. This is the layer what the users see. It's the closest to the end user of all layers. Example, Google Chrome, Firefox, HTTP, DNS, SMTP, and etc. Number 8, TCP IP model. TCP IP stands for Transmission Control Internet Protocol. Very similar to OSI model, TCP IP is a set of standardized rules that allows computers to communicate on network such as the internet. It helps you to determine if a specific computer should be connected to the network and how you can transfer data between them. It helps you to create virtual network when multiple computer networks are connected together. TCP IP model consists of the first one is the application. Application, presentation and session layers of OSI model to allow access to network resources. Number two is the transport. Uh, transport layer of OSI model to prove re, uh, reliable message and error delivery. Number three is the internet network layer of the OSI model to move packets from source to destination. Number four, network interface, data link and physical layer of the OSI model responsible for transmission between two devices on the same network. Number nine, what is the CIA trait or the information security? It stands for confidentiality, integrity, and availability. CIA is a model that is designed to guide policies for information security. Confidentiality is the level of secrecy that states the information should be accessible and readable for only authorized personnel. So encryption is very important here. Integrity is like hashing. It ensures that data is not corrupted or modified by unauthorized personnel. Availability states that the data should be available to users whenever needed. What is IP addressing and na name the IP address classes? Uh, Internet Protocol Address IP is a unique number that identifies a computer or another device. It's fundamental. It, it's the fundamental protocol for communications on the Internet. It specifies the way information is transferred and received by the network devices. IP addresses are uniquely identified the source and the destination of data transmitted. We have IP4 version and IP6 version available. IP4 addresses are 32 bits long. IP version 6 address 6 addresses are 128 bits long. There are five classes available with the IP4 uh, addresses A, B, C, D and E. Uh, class A is anywhere from uh, 1 to 126. Class 2, class B is anywhere from 128 to 191. 
Class C is anywhere from 192 to 223. Class D is anywhere from 224 to 239. Class E is anywhere from 240 to 254. I will name a port number and you will name the corresponding service protocol. All right. 20 and 21 is the FTP file transfer protocol. 22 is SSH secure shell. 23 is Telnet. 25 is SMTP simple mail transfer protocol. 53 is DNS domain name system. 110 is the POP post office protocol. 137, 38, 39 is NetBIOS. 143 is IMAP, Internet Message Access Protocol. 3389 is RDP, Remote Desktop Protocol. AD is HTTP, Hypertext Transfer Protocol. 43 is uh, HTTPS, Hypertext Transfer Protocol Secure. 445 is SMB, Server Message Block. 88 is Kerberos. 389 is LDAP. What's the purpose of NetBIOS and why should it be closed? NetBIOS allows applications on separate computers to communicate and establish sessions, to access shared resources such as files, printers, and find each other over a local area network. If it is not disabled, hackers can gather information about your network and users. What is the difference between symmetric and asymmetric encryption? Well, the difference between symmetric and asymmetric encryption is symmetric encryption uses the same key to encrypt and decrypt the data, while asymmetric encryption uses two different keys for encryption and decryption. One is public, the other one is private. Public key can be shared, but the private key must be kept secret. Symmetric encryption is fast, but more vulnerable, while asymmetric encryption is slow due to high computation. Symmetric encryption is used for bulk data transmission, while asymmetric encryption is used for securely exchanging the secret keys. So, symmetric encryption is used for bulk data transmission. Asymmetric encryption is used for securely exchanging secret keys. 13. What is a switch? A switch is a high-speed network device that receives incoming data packets and redirects them to their destination on a local area network. So it's a high-speed network device that receives incoming packets, data packets, and redirects them to their destination on a local area network. It works in the data link layer. Compared to hubs, switches are very smart because they know the MAC addresses of each device within your network. Hubs, on the other hand, sends packets to every device that is in your local area network. 14. What can be typically found in a DMZ? The purpose of DMZ is to add an extra layer of security to an organization's local area network. An external network node can only access what is exposed in DMZ, such as web servers, mail servers, FTP servers, or VoIP servers. DMZ functions as a small, isolated network positioned between the internet and the private network, while the rest of the organization's network is firewalled. Number 15. What sort of anomalies would you look for to identify a compromised system? Indicators of compromise, IOC, can help us detect intrusion attempts or any other malicious activities. By monitoring the indicators of compromise, 
organizations can detect attacks and act quickly to prevent breaches from occurring or they can limit the damages by stopping the attacks in their early stages. Example to some of the IOCs could be like uh, any unusual outbound network traffic, any anomalies in a privileged user account activity, any geographical irregularities, login anomalies, suspicious system or registry file changes, mismatched port, application traffic, signs of DDoS activity, unusual DNS request, large number of requests for the same file. How would you threaten user authentication? Is number 16. Authentication is the process of providing that someone is who he claims to be. To be effective, authentication works together with identification and authorization. Identification, such as username, determines whether the user is known to the system. Authorization determines whether the user is allowed the access to the resources to make authentication stronger. You can combine methods like multi-factor or two-factor authentication, which is the most common one, such as using PIN code as well as a token to log on to your network. Or in simple words, I would use either two-factor authentication or multi-factor to strengthen my device, such as using a PIN number and a token to log on to my network. Another example could be your ATM card, which is something you have, and then your PIN number, which is something you know in order to access your account. How would you handle a compromised endpoint? As an incident responder, I have to know how to manage and the aftermath of a security incident such as DDoS attacks, malware or ransomware infection, or successful phishing attempts or any encrypted laptop with sensitive customer record is missing. In order to identify a compromised endpoint, I would use the SANS six incident handler steps. And these steps are, Preparation, knowing how to handle the incident. Identification, determine whether the incident qualifies as a security incident. Containment, limiting the damage and isolating the effective system to prevent, prevent further damage. Eradication, figuring out the root cause and removing it from the production environment. Recovery, permit the effective system back and ensure that there are no threats remains. Lesson learned. Completing incident documentation, performance analysis to learn from the incident to improve future response efforts. So the first one is the preparation, then identification, then containment, eradication, recovery, and lesson learned. There are six steps. How? would you handle patch management? Patch management is necessary for the computers in our network. To be checked regularly for the missing patches and keep them up to date in order to reduce the risk of serious security breaches. Leaving software and operating system unpatched puts your organization at a big risk. There are steps that I can use to handle the patch management. The first thing I would do is to apply the vulnerability scanning. And then I will do the patching schedule. And then lastly, I would test and monitor it. Uh, number 19 is what is a watering hole attack? Watering hole attack is a strategy used by attackers to guess and observe which websites an organization often uses and infects one or more of the websites with malware. The goal here is to infect the victim's computer and gain access to the network. 
Watering hole attacks are targeted attacks, but they cast a wider net and trap more victims than the attacker's original objective. First, they choose a target and then they, they watch and observe which websites they often visit. And then they infect the website and gain access to the victim's computer. 20. What is a SIM or SIEM? Security Information and Event Management. SIEM software collects and aggregates log data generated through the organization's technology infrastructure from host systems and applications to network and security devices, such as firewalls and antivirus filters. The software then identifies and categorizes incidents and events and analyzes them. The software delivers on two main objectives, which are provide reports on security related incidents and events, such as successful and failed logins, malware activity, and other possible malicious activities, and then sends alerts if the analysis shows that an activity runs against the predetermined rule set and thus indicates a potential security issue. Splunk, IBM Q Radar, McAfee are the top SIEM providers. It basically collects logs, security related information from the security devices and customer endpoints and run AI artificial intelligence and analytics to bring forward correlated and user actionable human readable information. Another way to explain the SIEM is SIEM is a security information and event management. It's a software used by the SOCs to aggregate log data from the whole system, to identify incidents and events, and to categorize incidents and events, or to analyze them. 21. How would you prevent a zero-day attack? Zero day is an attack that exploits a vulnerability in a program or an application. If there is no patch available for a vulnerability, it's called zero day vulnerability in order to prevent it. I would start definitely start by updating all the applications on softwares once the security patches are released. Then I would implement a web application firewall to protect my website. It would help me to identify possible website attacks which with much accuracy. Then I would install small antivirus when set with sandboxing techniques and heuristic file analysis. These are some of the ways, of course. Difference between firewall and proxy. Hmm. We use both firewall and proxy for network security. Uh, there are, they are similar in a way to limit or block the connections from your network, but they accomplish this in a different ways. Firewalls are designed to permit or deny network transmissions based upon a set of rules, network and transport layer in OSI model. Firewalls act according to predefined rules, signatures that can block ports and programs, not signatures, sorry. Firewalls act according to predefined rules that can block ports and programs uh, that try to gain unauthorized access to your computer, while proxy servers basically hide your internal network from the internet. It works as a firewall in a sense that it blocks your network from being exposed to the internet by redirecting web requests when necessary. Firewalls and proxy servers both can help you block viruses and other forms of malware from infecting your computers. A firewall can block ports commonly used by malicious viruses and worms. You can also use firewalls to specify which ports can be open. Common ports that are usually open are HTTP, HTTPS, SMTP, POP3, you may wish to leave certain other ports open as well while closing the other ports. 
Proxy servers, on the other hand, create a barrier by being the middleman that sits between your network and the internet. Users outside your network can only see your proxy server, while those inside the network can access the internet only by passing through the proxy. This limits the window of opportunity through which viruses and worms can enter. 23. Can you describe a salted hash? A simple answer to this question would be, salt is a random data added to hashing process to enforce its uniqueness. It prevents damage that a rainbow or a table or dictionary attack could do. So salted hash is, um, salt is a random data added to hashing process to enforce its uniqueness. It prevents the damage that a rainbow table, uh, which they use the hashes, I believe, or the dictionary attack could do. According to OWASP guidelines, a salt is a fixed length, cryptographically strong random value that is added to the input of a hash to create unique hashes for every input, regardless of the input not being unique. What happens when you type google.com into your browser? When you type google.com into your browser, the first thing that happens is a um, domain name server DNS matches the google.com to an IP address because that's its job. Then the browser sends an HTTP request to the server and the server sends an HTTP response. The browser begins rendering the HTML on the web page while also requesting any additional resources such as CSS, JavaScript, images, and etc. Once the page is loaded, the browser sends further sync requests as needed. I didn't like this answer. This is a much better answer. When you type google.com into your browser, the first thing that happens is a, first thing is you enter a URL into the web browser. The browser looks up the IP addresses for the domain name via DNS. The browser sends an HTTP re request to the server. The server sends back HTTP response. Then the browser begins rendering the HTML. The browser sends requests for additional objects embedded in HTML, such as images, CSS, JavaScript, and etc and repeat the steps three to five times. Once the page is loaded, the browser sends further a sync request as needed. When would you use DNS? Uh, when would DNS use TCP instead of UDP? DNS uh, domain name system would use TCP when the size of the query is greater than 512 byte limit due to DNSSEC and IPv6's increased response sizes. DNS domain name system resolves the IP addresses to the uh, uh, names uh, or the URLs and it uses port number 53. 26. What's the difference between uh, UDP and TCP? I think we already answered this, but I can read it really quick. Uh, both protocols are used for sending packets of information over the network. TCP stands for Transmission Control Protocol and is more commonly used. It uh, numbers uh, the packets it sends to guarantee that the recipients receives them. Uh, UDP stands for user datagram protocol. While it operates similarly to TCP, it does not use TCP's error checking abilities, which speeds up the process, but makes it less reliable. 
what is a trace road or tracer? Oh, I remember reading this one too. Uh, it's a network diagnostic command to track and measure the data packets from their source to, source to their destination over an IP network. A trace route in Linux or tracer in Windows can help you to see if there is a breakdown of communication. It shows what routers you touch as you move along to your final destination. And if there is somewhere you cannot connect, you see where, where it happened. What is DLP? Data loss prevention is a set of tools and processes that is designed to make sure that the sensitive or confidential data on your network is not lost, stolen, or misused by unauthorized users, such as hackers or compromised malicious insiders. By utilizing both VLP software and techniques, security professionals can help stop data loss on, the, on their network, preventing coastal security events from occurring before they start. Email, USB block are some of the examples, I guess. What is a SOC, Security Operations Center? A security operations center is an organizational structure that continuously monitors and analyzes the security procedures of an organization. So it's an organizational structure that continuously monitors and analyzes the security procedures of an organization. It also defends against security breaches and actively isolates and mitigates, mitigates the security risks. So it monitors, analyzes, it's also defending uh, uh, through, through, uh, towards, um, against any security breaches and actively isolates and mitigates the security risks. A SOC tracks and analyzes activity on servers, endpoints, networks, applications, databases, websites, and other technology systems. Its team members provide a critical layer of analysis needed to seek any irregular, irregular activities that could suggest a security incident. While technology systems such as IPS or firewalls can prevent basic attacks, human expertise is needed to respond to serious incidents. Security Information and Event Management SIEM is a solution that empowers SOC analysts by collecting security data from across the enterprise, identifying events that have security relevance and bringing them to the attention of the SOC team. A modern SIEM puts all the relevant information in front of security specialists to help them identify and mitigate incidents faster. What are the basic responsibilities of a SOC team? Hmm. A SOC tracks and analyzes activity on the servers, endpoints, networks, applications, and databases, websites, and other technology systems as well. Uh, their responsibilities are to implement and manage security tools, uh, investigate suspicious activities, contain and prevent them, reduce the downtime and ensure uh, business continue to uh, plan security, stra uh, security strategies, audit and compliance support, dwell time. Let's take a look at the dwell time. It's uh, dwell time shows us the average time uh, between the initial compromise and its detection. In other words, it shows us how long the attackers stayed in our system until we discover and mitigate them. What is the incident response? Incident response IR uh, is basically how you handle security incidents, breaches, and cyber threats. You have to have a well-defined incident response plan to identify an attack, minimize the damage, and reduce the cost. Security incidents can be a high pressure situation. So your incident response team must focus on the critical uh, task right away. We can use NIST or SANS, it's, it's the, pretty much the same things. Uh, computer Security Handling Guide, which consists of four steps. 
we are going to be using the NIST here. Uh, the first one is the preparation and then um, detection and analysis, containment, eradication and recovery, and the post-incident activity is the fourth one. So preparation, you have to have a plan in advance on how to handle and prevent security incidents. That's the preparation. Second one is the detection and analysis, which is monitoring and looking for signs of any potential attack. Third one is the containment, eradication and recovery. You have to have a, you have to actually develop a containment strategy and identify and mitigate the host and the system under the attack and have a plan for recovery. Fourth one is the post-incident activity, which is the lesson learned part. <clears throat> so you need to document everything for the future investigations. Uh, 33. What is the cyber kill chain or the incident's life cycle? It's a methodology for describing the phases of a cyber attack from the early reconnaissance to the goal of data exfiltration. So it's Lockett Martin's, um, uh, uh, you know, methodology uh, for describing the phases of a cyber attack from the very early reconnaissance uh, to the goal of data exfiltration. In order to have a successful attack, the hackers must go through the cyber kill chain steps and there are seven stages of a successful attack. The first one is the reconnaissance, information gathering stage to identify the target's vulnerabilities. It could be done either passive or active. Uh, weaponization attackers create a malware weapon such as virus or a worm for the vulnerable target. Number three is the delivery, delivering the weapon to the target either through email, website or USB. Exploitation is the fourth one, and in this stage, malware code triggers and takes action to exploit the vulnerability. Installation. Attackers can now install the malware code and create a backdoor. And once they create a backdoor, then they can do command and control. So they can control and manipulate the target. Number seven is actions on objectives. Attackers, they're achieving their goals, such as either for data encryption, extraction, or a ransomware. What is a PCAP file? Can you read a PCAP and explain what you saw there? PCAP files are mainly associated with Wireshark, which is a program that is used for analyzing the network or the sniffing tool. PCAP files are data files created using this program and they contain the packet data of a network. These files are mainly used in analyzing the network characteristics of a certain data. And these files also contribute to successfully controlling traffic of a certain network since they are being monitored by the program. The data and the results of the network analysis are saved using the PCAP file extension, which is why they are called PCAP files. These files are used to determine network status, allowing analyzers to attend to problems that may have occurred on the network and allowing them to study the communications using Wireshark. Since Wireshark can be accessed in Windows, Mac, and Linux, these PCAP files can also be opened, provided the appropriate applications used to open them are found on the system. Some common applications that can open PCAP files are Wireshark, WinDump, TCP dump, packet square, capadit, and uh, ethereal. Ethereal, ethereal. 
this answer is from Google. Uh, network uh, analyzers use Wireshark to create PCAP files to collect and record the packet data from a network. These PCAP files can be used to view TCP IP and UDP network packets. If you want to record network traffic, you can use P uh, packet sniffing tool like Wireshark or TCP dump. So have you ever done any PCAP file analysis in Wireshark? Uh, yes, I have. Let me give you an example. I was requested to work on a PCAP file by my SAC manager and the steps that I followed were, you know, right click on the related PCAP file and opened it with the Wireshark. So the first thing you do is you open the PCAP file with Wireshark and to see traffic activity types and file sizes, I went to statistics tab and then chose protocol hierarchy and check the results. So to see the uh, traffic activity types and file sizes, you go to statistics tabs and then you choose the protocol hierarchy and check the results. I observe a significantly higher size of data in FTP data under TCP protocol. Then right click on the FTP data and apply as filter then select it after this filter and I observed high file packages with the name infosec zip. So what he did is that after he uh, observed significantly higher size of data in FTP data under TCP protocol, he right click on the FTP data and then he applied filter. Then selected after this filter, uh, he observed high size of file packages with the name infosec zip. Then he right clicked on the uh, on one of the uh, lines follow, then TCP stream. Then he obtained a page beginning with PK and continuing with unreadable characters. Then he saved it using the raw data option and renamed it as infosec zip, then closed it. Then he e extracted the zip file to the folder, then observed the, uh, the info in the file. Another case. Clicked on the magnifier tab change the dis display filter to string filter, then searched for logged in or user detected, right click on the page, follow TCP stream, obtain detailed information including username and passwords. Vallahi hiçbir şey anlamadım bundan. Tell me about pen testing. In short, it's a type of security testing to uncover threats, risk, and vulnerabilities that can be exploited by an attacker. It is also called pen testing or ethical hacking practice. Pen testing tests are conducted by ethical hackers to mimic the strategies and actions of an attacker, and organizations are hiring these pen testers to act and think like a an hacker and find vulnerabilities in their system by providing a little bit of knowledge, no knowledge, or all knowledge. There are five steps of a pen testing. Uh, the first one is the signs of vulnerability and then design an attack, appoint them to uh, appoint them of ethical hackers, determine what kind of data they could steal, act on the findings. Quality of pen testing should give you a deep insight into the uh, organization's overall security posture. Uh, 36. What is the OWASP top 10 list and why it is important? Um, Open Web Application Security Project is a nonprofit organization dedicated to web application security. Top 10 list is a report outlining the 10 most critical risks for web application security.
It's important because it gives the organizations a priority on which risk to focus and help identify, mitigate, and fix the vulnerabilities in their systems. The 2021 OWASP top 10 list are uh, broken access control, cryptographic failures, injection, insecure design, um, security misconfigurations, vulnerability, outdated components, identification and authentication failures, uh, software and data integrity failures, security logging and monitoring failures, server side request forgery, SSRF. So knowing at least a couple of them would definitely helpful. Um, broken access control is ac access control policy enforces that the users cannot act outside of their intended permissions. Failures typically led to unauthorized information disclosure, modification, or distractions. Common access control vulnerabilities include uh, permitting, viewing, or deleting someone else's account by providing its unique identifier, acting as a user without being logged in, or acting as an admin when logged in as a user elevation of privilege, bypassing access control check checks by modifying the URL. Number two is the crypto cryptographic failures, uh, previously known as sensitive data exposure. Uh, it occurs if the data is transmitted in a clear text by using protocols like HTTP, SMTP, or if any old or weak cryptographic algorithm or protocols are used. Injection, uh, it occurs if the user supplied data is not validated, filtered, or sanitized by the application, one of the common injections uh, injection is a SQL. In order to prevent SQL injection, having an input validation, uh, proper error handling, and WAF is very important. What's the most uh, secure way of protecting the data? Depending on the sensitivity of the data, we may want to use different ways to protect our data. Encryption is the best way to provide, provide protect uh, privacy and confidentiality of your data. And there are two types of encryption methods. One is asymmetric, the other one is symmetric encryption. Symmetric encryption uses only one key for encryption and decryption. It's faster because there is a little calculation involved, but asymmetric encryption uses two different keys. One public, the other one is private. Public key can be shared with anybody else, but the private key must be kept secret. That's a little bit slower comparing to symmetric encryption because there is more calculation involved. Uh, the process of data encryption um, data or plain text is encrypted with an encryption algorithm, an encryption key. The process results in ciphertext, which only can be weaved in its original form if, the decrypted, if, if it is decrypted with the correct key. So the plain uh, text, once you encrypt the plain uh, text, it's, it's turning into, it results with cyber, cyber text and you can only decrypt the cyber text if you have the correct key. Symmetric key ciphers uses the same key for encrypting and decrypting the message or file. Symmetric key encryption is much faster than asymmetric encryption. The sender must exchange the encryption key with the recipient before he can decrypt it. On the other hand, asymmetric cryptography, sometimes referred as public key cryptography, uses two different keys, one public and one private. The public key, as it is called, may be shared with everyone, but the private key must be protected. What's the difference, 39, between encoding, encryption, and hashing? Hmm. All these techniques are used for converting the format of data. Encoding transforms the data into another format using a scheme that is 
publicly available so that it can be easily reversed. It doesn't require any key. Encryption transforms the data into another format, format and it is used for keeping the data secret. In hashing, and this provides a key, uh, it requires a key, by the way. In hashing, uh, it's usually a number generated from a string of tags. Hashing is reversible. Hashing makes the data unique. You know, it's, it's used to make your data more unique and it's not reversible. What is a DDoS attack? DDoS is short for Distributed Denial of Service. DDoS is a type of DOS attack where the multiple compromised systems often infected with a Trojan are used to target a single system causing denial of service. DOS attacks are coming from only one source, while the DDoS coming from many compromised systems. In other words, DDoS is flooding the target's network or service with constant traffic, which overwhelms the system, causing denial of service. DDoS is a cyber attack on a specific server or network. It's an attack from the multiple sources all at once. Uh, you know, it's or it, another way to explain is multiple compromised computer systems uh, that are used as sources like bots, botnets to target the server, service or network by overwhelming the target with traffic. To prevent DDoS, we can use web application firewall, load balancers, Cloudflare platform. How do routers work? To put it simply, a router connects devices within a network by forwarding the data packets between them. This data can be sent between the devices or from devices to the internet. The router does this by assigning a local IP to each of the devices on the network. Or router connects the devices within a network and connect the devices to the internet. So we are using routers to connect the devices in our local area network and also to the internet. It What it does is that it forwards packets of data, acts as a dispatcher, choosing the best route for information to travel. 42. Explain how to make a SQL query to search a database. SQL structured query language is used to communicate with database. It is the standard language for database management system. SQL is used to perform tasks such as updating data on a database, retrieve the data from a database, Example, some of the examples uh, that we can use when you are writing a SQL query is where, get, from, or, not, and. Describe DNS. DNS, domain name system, are the internet's phone book. It basically translates domain names to IP addresses for computers to access websites based on IP addresses. DNS uses port number 53. What protocol DNS use? DNS uses UDP, user datagram protocol, port number 53 to serve the request. It will use TCP if the data is over 512 byte. So, so the, in short, uh, DNS uses both TCP and UDP depending on the uh, data uh, byte. If it's over 512 byte limit, it uses TCP, uh, but if it's uh, less than that, it's using UDP. How would you defend against a cross-site scripting access as attack? This is like also an HTML code scripting. Cross-site scriptings are done, um, cross-site scripting 
is done by injecting client-side scripts into a web application and redirect them to malicious websites. In order to protect the company from cross-site scripting, I would definitely go ahead and use input validation, a web application firewall, error handling, and web vulnerability scanning. The same things that uh, we use also to prevent SQL injections or the input validation, web application, firewall, and error handling. XSS stands for cross-site scripting, meaning that the attackers inject malicious script into the web application and then redirect them to the malicious site. Uh, there are two, three types of actually XSS. And we're going to be talking about two of them here. Uh, the difference between stored and reflected XSS. Stored attacks are those where the injected script is permanently stored on the target servers, such as in a database, in a message form, visitor log, command field, and etc. These are the stored attacks. Reflected XSS is embedded to a link and it's only activated once it's clicked on. In other words, the attackers puts the malicious script directly into the web server. Subnet. A subnet is a logical portion par uh, partition of an IP network into multiple smaller network segment. It's typically used to subdivide large networks into smaller or more efficient sub uh, networks. You typically, you, I mean, you simply divide large networks into small, smaller, more, more efficient subnetworks. Each organization's network can be composed of many smaller networks or subnets. Each subnet allows its connected devices to communicate with each other and routers are used to communicate between the subnets. Uh, 48, uh, 32 and 24, how many hosts? Hmm. IPv4 addresses includes a total of 32 bits. Okay, 24 bits used for subnet mask and eight bits are used uh, per host and using the formula 2 my 2n minus 2 uh, you have 254 unusable ip addresses from 1 through 254 if somebody asks you a question with an ip number to, with 255 that's not correct you cannot have an ip address with 254 because it's up until 254. TCP IP header. TCP header is the first 24 bytes of a TCP segment that helps diagnose communication issues between the two endpoints. So a TCP header is the first 24 bytes of a TCP segment that help diagnose communication issues between the two endpoints. TCP flags, they help us understand the state of communication between the endpoints, TCP flags. Some of the common TCP flags are SYN, ACT, FIN, URGE, PUSH, RESET. And TCP flags are uh, you know, helping us to understand the state of communication. We already said that. TCP flags are used to indicate a particular state during TCP conversation. TCP flags can be used for troubleshooting purposes or control how a particular con uh, connection is handled. Each of uh, them has its own significance and corresponds to one bit information. They initiate connections to carry data, tear down connections. The most commonly used TCP flags are SYN, ACT, uh, RST is the reset, FIN is the finish, URGE is the urgent, uh, PSH is the push. Urgent flag indicates that the urgent pointer uh, file, uh, fill, file, urgent pointer uh, filed is filled. Uh, is significant. 
the urgent pointer indicates that the incoming data is urgent and that a TCP segment with the urge flag set is proceed, uh, processed immediately without consideration of having to wait on a previously, previously sent TCP segment. It indicates that it's urgent, it can't wait, uh, you know, so act fast. Act acknowledgement flag indicates that the acknowledgement number is significant. It is used to acknowledge the receipt of a TCP segment. Push flag asking TCP to pass the data to the application promptly. It's asking TCP to pass the data to the application. Reset flag is used to reset the connection. Another device, such as a firewall, might send it uh, to tier a TCP connection. This flag is also used when the data is sent to a host and there is no service on the receiving end to answer. So you have to reset it if there is no answer. When you are um, uh, trying to send a data to a host and then there is no service on the receiving side, uh, you know, you... You reset, you reset it. A SYN synchronized flag is used to indicate a TCP three-way handshake and synchronize sequence numbers with the other host. The sequence number should be set randomly during TCP connection establishment. FIN is the sender has no more data to send, so it's finished. Finish flag. HTTP header. HTTP headers are mainly intended for the communication between the server client in both directions. They are used for the communication between the server and the client in both directions. Uh, SQL injection. Attackers use SQL injections to back and databases through web servers for accessing and reading the sensitive data, modifying the data, or destroying the database. Many SQL injection attacks uses the phrase like one equal one to trick, trick the database server into providing information. SQL injections are used uh, to either modify or destroy the databases. Input validation, error handling, and the web application firewall definitely can help re reduce the risk of uh, SQL injection attacks. What are the differences between vulnerability scanning and pen testing? Vulnerability scans looks for known vulnerabilities in the system and report any potential exposures. Pen tests are, uh, or the penetration testing, intended to exploit weaknesses in the architecture of your IT network and determine the degree to which a malicious attacker can gain unauthorized access to your assets. Another way to explain this is vulnerability scanning reports potential and known vulnerabilities in the network devices and pen testing is finding a way to exploit a new vulnerability. I mean, they're looking for both known and unknown vulnerabilities in the system and then exploiting uh, the vulnerabilities as well. Authenticated, in other words, credentialed and unauthenticated, uncredentialed vulnerability scanning. Uh, Non-credentialed means a non-credentialed scan will monitor the network and see any vulnerabilities that an attacker would easily find. Uh, we should fix the vulnerabilities with uh, uh, found uh, with a non-credentialed scan first, as this is what the hacker will see when they enter to your network. Credentialed scan is much safer version uh, of the vulnerability scanner. It provides more detailed information than non-credentialed scan. Uh, what is port scanning and the tools? Port scanning is one of the most popular techniques attackers use to discover which ports on a network are open for receiving and sending the data. Uh, it's the active reconnaissance uh, uh, of the uh, MidraTech framework. Um, it's a way to find if there is any open 
or closed ports for sending and receiving the data. And the tools that I know can be used for uh, port scanning are Nmap, uh, Zcat, Zenmap. Vulnerability scanning tools. Uh, it's a technique used to identify security weaknesses in a computer system. And the tools that we can use for the vulnerability scanning are um, port scanning, network vulnerability scanning, web application security scanning, Nest sustainable IO. What's a phishing? Phishing is a type of social engineering attack uh, often used to steal user data, including login credentials and credit card numbers or any other personal inf uh, information. Uh, it could be done through an email, instant message, or text message. Types of phishing attacks are spear phishing, whaling, smishing, wishing, email uh, phishing. Email phishing is regular emails that uh, phishing emails that comes to you. Wishing is sent with voice. Smishing is uh, uh, sent with the, the SMS uh, through the text messages. Whaling is targeting like a CEO or the top, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, executive officers of a company. And then, um, yeah, that's all. Where are the logs on Linux and Windows hosts? In Linux, it's under the Event Weaver, System32, Win Event Log. In Linux, it's under the var log directory. And in the Mac, it's uh, console uh, var log. Rainbow table attack. Rainbow table attacks are types of attacks that attempts to discover the password from the hash, and they use the rainbow tables, which are huge databases of pre-computed hashes to discover the password. Similar to a dictionary attack, but in dictionary attack, it's the clear form of text, but here it's the hash. Walk me through your day at your current uh, work. Um, I start my day by signing into my emails to see if there is anything handed over to me from the previous shift or if there are any important messages from my manager. I always use open up my SIM and EDR solution tools right away and start monitoring the activities. My main responsibilities are to monitor potential and active threats in our network and incident response. I also do phishing analysis. I monitor the notables using Splunk Enterprise and assign individual events to myself to conduct IR processes on them. I also use CrowStrike for endpoint detection and response to detect, identify and contain any threats uh, of the endpoints. After completing my analysis, I document everything using the ticketing system, IBM Security Source, Resilient, and Jira. At the end of the day, before I hand out my shift, I give out all the important information relating to a particular incident that I was working on. What's the difference between an event, alert, and incident? Events are captured changes in the environment. Example, typing on a keyboard, receiving an email, or updating the firewall can be an event. Alerts are the notification that the specific events took place and incidents are special events that negatively impact the CIA trade and cause an impact on the business. Not all events are incidents, but all incidents are events. Uh, what's the difference between on-premise in, uh, and in in the cloud. Essentially, the fundamental difference between the cloud versus on-premise software is where it resides. On-premise software is installed locally on your businesses, computers, and servers, where the cloud software is hosted on the vendor's server and accessed via web browser. If you don't want to think about updating cloud uh, updating cloud would be a good choice but if you don't want to share your vulnerabilities on the cloud uh, you know on premise would be a better choice what are the most common types of alerts that you have dealt with 
uh, within your experience, uh, threat activities, password brute forcing, excessive failed logins, unwanted DNS requests, uh, remote desktop network traffic. Explain direction flow on network and security devices. We collect all the logs uh, of the events in our SIEM tools. We can monitor them through the events and flows. Event flow, uh, event flow is, a, is a summarized way of monitoring network connections. Event flow is a summarized way uh, of monitoring the network connections. Describe how you solve a technical solution where you did not previously know the solution. I would search the Google first and then get consultations from someone else about me. What is on your home network? We have cable internet through Xfinity that is connected to the main router in our home. That router also has Wi-Fi mesh system, which extends the dead spots in our home, especially our kids' rooms. We have also four wired, uh, wired uh, local area network cable connected through the network switches to the main router. And this and network switch is managed, meaning that the routing is done automatically through the MAC addresses, so no setup is necessary. We have another router in our master bedroom, which is in a different subnet that handles the IoT devices and any other small board computers and printers. The reason we do this is to separate the network traffic from the main router. We also use UPS uh, on interrupted power supply in case of power outage. What is a malware and tell me the types of malwares that you know? Any malicious software that is specifically designed to gain access to, to or damage a computer. Uh, works with EXE, DOCS, XLS, and etc. Type of malwares, virus. Computer virus is a type of malware that attaches to another program, like a document, which can replicate and spread after a person first runs it on their system. Worm spreads through a network by replicating itself. Uh, Trojan viruses disguises itself as a desirable code, like an, uh, it, it would look like a legitimate um, uh, program. Adware serves unwanted advertisements. Spyware collects users' activity data without their knowledge. Ransomware disables victims' access to data until the ransom is paid. Fileless malware makes changes to files that are native to operating system. 